Now, the Campana province has probably heard a bit of in the last few years. We have, there's been a lot of work done between us and GSWA. But just a bit of background, it's located between the three main cratonic blocks of Australia, that is the Western Australian Craton, South Australian Craton, and the Northern Australian Craton. Until recently, it was relatively unknown, and this is mainly because it's completely covered in the, the, uh, in the basins. So there's no exposures at all of this, of this province. However, in the last few years, there's been a swathe of new data, such as aeromagnetics, seismic, and drilling, which has revealed that the area, or the region, has a three-stage project history that can be traced from about 2 billion to 10, 70 million years. Now, um, there's a series of posters out in the poster room that cover a lot of these aspects of this history. But I'm going to talk on the uh, 1070 age event, which is right at the end of the project history, focus on the magnetism and deformation, and I'll, at the end I'll talk about some of the implications of mineral prospectivity. <clears throat> so uh, why 1070? Now, 1070 is quite an interesting uh, age for Central Australia. The Warrakoon, a large English province or LIP, uh, has, was recognised by, by, by Mike Wingate in 2004. It extends across Central and Central Australia and Central WA. It's a large region. It was originally interpreted as a plume, lots of mafic, ultramafic magnetism, but also felsic magnetism, so it's a sort of mantle and crustal melts. It was um, proposed by Hugh Smithies as a continuation of the high T Musgraven orogeny. So rather than a plume, you've just sort of got focused heat flow for a very, very long time, for several hundred million years. And uh, recently it was proposed that magnetism was focused between these cratonic blocks that surround it. So it just sort of melt, the heat just flowed up and just ponded. Now it's also interesting from an economic point of view because in the red circle is the Giles complex which has a, a, a heap of deposits such as Nebo Babel. But also from the South Australian perspective, out in the blue circle we have the Alcara dolerites which are part of this, the uh, Warrakurna Large Ignis province, and they've also been prospective for copper, nickel and other elements. So 1070 is quite an interesting, exciting time. With the uh, drilling program that we undertook, we put eight holes in. Uh, seven of those in the basement, one ended up in basalts, and one of the holes, CDP2, which is targeted that small anomaly encircled in black, it was olivine dolerite, had granophoric zones, it was quite interesting, quite complex. It wasn't just a homogenous rock, it was a lot of different textures, and Liz Jagzinski did a great job logging it. And it was dated 1074, which is within the era of the Warrakona lip. Now within the rock you can sort of see that the feldspars are pretty fresh in the uh, thin section photo, so there's very little alteration of this rock at this point. But they are obviously remnantly magnetised. You can sort of see they're just very, very big prominent features that stand out. With the, I've sort of mentioned the remnant magnetism, that's one thing that, high, that sort of makes these features stand out. They occur at a range of scales. So um, the one that we, next to the two in the, um, towards the centre bottom of the photo of the map, is the one that we drilled. We also drilled CDP7, which has got an arrow, it's a quite a small thing, small blip, and it's caught up in the shear zone. So uh, rather than being this, the odd, no, a couple of features, these are dominant in this area, and they range from the, uh, the feature we drilled in seven, which is about 500 metres across. There's a range of two to 10 kilometre dome of bodies, which is sort of highlighted. You can see that some of them are north striking, the one just to the, um, west of the main anomaly, the big one labelled three. There's also the compounded magnetic anomaly, which is numbered three. It's 40 kilometres across, 40 kilometres across, sorry. It's also interesting, it's been modelled by Clive Foss at Syro to be about six kilometres deep. It's actually below the granite. So you can see the magnetic texture on the southern edge. That's actually the granite overlying it. So this thing is six k's deep, but still has a signal like that. So. Uh, there's a poster outside that talks about how do we produce something like this. Interestingly, uh, there are also the dikes you can see at the top of the photo, labelled four, they head up towards the uh, sort of northwest. They're magnetised. They seem to follow fractures that crop the granite. And there's also uh, in the south east part of the project area, where CDP 008, there were olivine basalt lava flows. They had flow top fractures. These aren't sort of a, this isn't like a differentiated intrusive. These are good lava flows, and they were found in that area. And they're geochemically indistinct from the, these larger intrusive bodies. 
So uh, we've seen, looked in the air in that black box down in that, the map, but we can sort of see these features swing up towards the uh, northwest. They cross the border of WA, and then they trace up along the Mundabilla Fault, which is that black dashed line, and they, then they continue up to where they intersect the Musgraves. So um, we've got the temporal connection. We've also now got a spatial connection with the Warrakona Lip, and more, in, and more importantly, with the Giles in the complex. So we've got those deposits. So this is quite an interesting uh, connection to be able to make. And that figure on the lower left sort of highlights how it, this, uh, the lip should now be shown, the large igneous province, how, as it looks. As well as the uh, magmatism 1070, we also have alteration which we managed to constrain, constrain at the same age. Now, of the holes, they're all generally fresh, as we saw in that CDP7, oh, sorry, CDP2. But CDP6, which is highlighted right in the trace of the Palinar shear zone, is generally highly altered. You can see the, the photo top, on top right with lots of hematite. You can see the way it's picked out the um, migmatitic layering, where the one to the lower right has got two rock types. The top part of the core is the um, migmatitic gneisses, and it's got a lot of sericite chloride alteration. But the rock on the bottom is part of the, uh, the, the making intrusive rocks. It's a sheet that has ge similar geochemistry to the main large bodies. So this is a, about three metre wide sheet. And you can see that it's cut by veins and it's also been altered. So uh, it's quite interesting that some of these maker bodies are altered, others aren't. And that sort of gives us some idea about the timing constraints. If we look at the veining in this drill hole, we, we find that there's uh, two main patterns the serenets, there's uh, the veins are either, say, roughly towards the northeast, which corresponds to the trace of the Palinar shear zones, so it suggests these features are being reactivated, the structure is reactivated. We also see with the quartz calcite veins and sericite veins, there are some in north south striking. And if you look at the photos, core photos on the left, we can see that these are related to, uh, that's looking as if we're looking north, these are sub vertical steep dipping holes, so we're looking towards the north. And you can see that these have extensional jogs, which suggest east-west extension. So what we see at, during the veining alteration, that there's reactivation of the polymer shear zone, but there's also a component of east-west extension. So we're in the transtensional setting at this time. So um, we can see that the holes, the uh, core of mafic rocks contain both altered and unaltered. In particular, six has got heavily altered mafic sheets where Two and seven, which occur within the trace of where we think the high strain zone occurs, are unaltered. So this overlap in time suggests that they are, sorry, this overlap of textures and relationships suggests that the alteration in magmatism occurred at the same time and makes us believe that this is happening at 1070. It also appears that alteration is quite restricted, it's possibly quite restricted, because just to the north of CDP6 we drilled a hole in the granite there above the large intrusion. There is no sign of alteration in this, so it's quite discreet. So uh, we've got localised alteration occurring along a reactivated structure during this transcensional event. So sort of stepping back to the big scale, we've sort of managed, we talked before about this um, trace, new trace of the Warrakerna lip, and um, we can sort of now start to suggest that it occurred at 1070, and alteration occurred at the same time, we had structural reactivation. So as well as just the magmatism occurring, there's also a lot of structural and fluid flow processes going. So that made us question, could there be a structural control on the extension of the lip? And uh, when we looked at it, we sort of follow it, you now it sort of looks pretty obvious, Try, trend two heads up towards the uh, north, northwest, hits the Mundrabilla Fault, then just cruise up towards the Musgraves. Now, something that's quite interesting with this Mundrabilla shear zone, it's been suggested, uh, it's, it's been reported in a lot of papers. Unfortunately, it's buried, so everything is based on remote sense data. But it's currently considered to have a long lived history. It can be traced through the Musgraves. And in one story, it's proposed that movement from the Mundrabilla shear zone destabilised the thermal anomaly that I mentioned before that underlie, underlay the a Musgraves, and may have triggered the Giles complex. That's something that's been proposed by Smithies and others at GSWA. 
So it looks like you know, the two trends have got, there could be a structural control on those. One is that the magnetism came down along the mandibular shear zone. But then the uh, question is, we've got this palinar shear zone that's reactivating this time. So could that northwest trend, the one I've got is trend two, could that form a conjugate? So you've got a bit of a tear there. And that's quite an interesting um, idea. And I think that's something that uh, down the track when Auslamp extends in WA, that you might be interested to see if there's evidence for that. Now, we sort of talked about geology. We've told you a bit of a story about what we think is happening at the time. And I just sort of want to give you a bit of an interview, some thoughts about the prospectivity of these rocks. Now, the, the main one, or the first one, would be that they make intrusive rocks themselves perspective. If we look at the examples from the uh, Western Musgrave province in the Giles complex, that uh, say, for example, Nebo Bay, well, nickel copper prospect occurs in the conduit, which they think is below a main intrusion. The Winterlina Hills PGE occurs as stratiform reefs at the top of ultramafic units in the late intrusion, so we're at the base of a big complex, but also Haley's, which has got a range of commodities, occurs in the stratiform reef at the evolved top of a late intrusion. So it's sort of quite exciting that um, these intrusions, these big intrusions that have been recognised, have mineral potential at all levels, in the, in the feeders, in the base, but also in the top. So, it's sort of something that um, the idea, the area becomes quite interesting from that mineral point of view. Now, the other one is perhaps indirect, where that was direct, this is now indirect. Is it possible that heat from the mafic magmas created a thermal regime promoting fluid circulation in country rocks? Now, these fluids could have scavenged and redistributed metals. Now, we've seen reactivation, we've got big intrusions, and at one six kilometres down, we've got local intrusions. So, uh, it's possible that we've got this uh, bit of a mix going on, add, all adding ingredients. So um, there's the, the thing, the geochemistry suggests that the mafic magmas are dry, but what about magmatic volatiles? There's been studies that show that mafic dry volatiles can transport gold upwards. Now that's been shown in the US. And also, because uh, we're at high levels, we've got those basalts nearby, and with high level intrusion. Could there be meteoric water that's moving down? So could we have a hydrothermal system where you're circulating meteoric water? So um, this is more just uh, sort of throwing out there that you know, there's, this area has got a lot, of, um, a lot of things going on that could promote mineral, uh, promote mineral prospectivity. So take home message. We're sort of back to this uh, flat landscape. Doesn't really tell you much, but uh, I'm sort of hope I'm going to convince you in this talk that at, you know, underneath this uh, salt bush area at 1070, there was a major mafic magmatic event. It represents the extension of the Warrakona lip into the southwestern South Australia. And this event may have been structurally controlled. We also see that a major northeast trending transcentral shear zone was reactivated at this time. And it's possible that because uh, of the uh, the stresses related to that reactivation, that there are far field stresses going on. This is sort of unfortunate with eight drill holes, so it's a bit hard to actually sort of pin this down more. This also has implications for mineral prospectivity, for example, directly through mafic magmatic systems, but also indirectly through the introduction of heat, promoting fluid circulation, and which also appears to be structurally focused. So thank you.